December 2011 in Cairo, during a protest in Tharia Square, a woman was captured on video being dragged across the ground. As her body was being moved and attacked, her abaya, the name for the long loose cloak worn by women in many Arab and Muslim countries, came undone, exposing her midriff and her blue bra. This moment became a catalyst for a growing women's movement in Egypt. You're listening to Beyond the Headlines. I'm your host, Aisha Khan, and this week we're looking at how Egypt's Me Too movement is changing the country. Although people refer to the women's movement as the Egyptian Me Too, the term is a shorthand for a movement against sexual harassment. Me Too took place on a global stage in 2017, and Egypt's Blue Bra Girl, as she became known, preceded that moment by many years. The reason Blue Bra Girl became a symbol and a rallying call were manifold. She was representative of so many women who had over the years been targeted and abused at protests, symbolic of a society that often did not care about sexual harassment, seeking to blame women for drawing the abuse on themselves by what they wore or for being out of the home or for trying to participate in public life. The disregard for the woman's privacy and dignity in exposing her body and underwear, a woman that wore a traditional covering, was a powerful reminder to the conservative Muslim country that wearing conservative clothing cannot protect a woman from harassment. Rajia Omran is a corporate lawyer from Egypt who has been a human rights and women's rights activist since the mid-90s. She does pro bono work as a human rights lawyer and has won the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award as well as the Franco-German Prize for Human Rights and the Rule of Law. As a cause of this photo, a huge protest was organised by activists, women's organisations, everyone who was involved in the revolution that went all around, like downtown, right following this incident, and they kept the, the main chant was that women's Egyptian women are a red line. Like you do not cross that line. You do not if you're arresting a woman, you do not expose her, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because it was it was quite a very like shocking image to have that, and it was plastered all over the international media. Angie Goslan is a social activist from Egypt. She remembers the impact the image of the woman in the blue bra had on the country. During that time, it was quite a charged time for Egypt. A lot of people's um, hopes were up and a lot of dreams were, you know, were, um, were pursued. And we tried, the, the young people especially uh, had a lot of hopes. And I think the, this image was a bit shocking and at the same time controversial because people who believed in the goodness of all of what was happening were, were kind of shocked to see that women could be treated this way in the street something that most women in this country have experienced in silence for a long time and were trying for so many years to raise their voices. But I think the image uh, got kind of symbolic because it was very obvious, um, the kind of attacks and the kind of assault that could that could take place on women. There were a lot of people who were shocked, but a lot of people who also didn't believe the photo because they, they said it was too much. Um, but Things like that happen and um, it was about time to kind of start talking about it. And I have to say that after that, a lot of discussions were stirred and a lot of achievements actually took place. Although this was a crucial moment for the country, women had been organising for years to try and tackle the issues around harassment and women's rights. Rajia herself began her activism over 25 years ago. I grew up, uh, you know, very interested in the women's movement, suffragette movement from when I was in high school. And and that's why I chose to go to Bryn Mawr, which is an all women's college in the U.S. It's right outside of Philadelphia. And so and I came back to Cairo. Um, I got involved with uh, a feminist organization, one of the oldest feminist organizations, which is the New Woman Foundation. I joined in, in 95, right? I graduated in 94, so just as soon as I came back. And I, I became involved in civil society through the Newman Foundation. And through that, I got to know people from the human rights movement. NG Goslan has been working on issues of sexual harassment and gender-based violence for 14 years. She was one of the co-founders of HarassMap, which launched in 2010 an initiative that targeted tackling sexual harassment from different perspectives, mainly the community engagement part and how can we change perspectives in the street? How can we take this? The, the whole idea was that women could have this tool, an online interactive map, that ca- they can report uh, sexual harassment through their mobile phones in a text message to a short number. 
And this text message goes automatically into our online map and shows you where is sexual harassment taking place in Egypt. And the idea was to generate that data that was generated by women themselves as it occurs in the street, as it happens live. And, and that was because that even when we launched the map in 2010, we were still getting all those attacks that it's not really happening. It's not as bad as you think. It's just in urban settings. It doesn't happen in rural city areas and so on. So we wanted to have this kind of map and a proof to say, no, look, it's happening all over the country. Women had been speaking about and working to change attitudes in Egypt for over a decade before the blue bra became a symbol for the movement. But the change had been slow. When Harass Map tried to get people on the ground involved in their initiative, to help report cases and build a safe community that stood against sexual harassment, Engie found she had a big task ahead of her to try and change the attitudes of the people. And the first reactions were usually blaming the girl, blaming the survivor. I, I like to use the word survivor, not victim, because we're not victims of this. We are more of survivors. And they usually blame, blame the survivor, you know, the way she was dressed, you know, why was she going out that late? Why was she walking in an empty street? So what we did was the first step that we did in our community uh, outreach program was actually to sit together along with a big group of volunteers from different walks of life and to think collectively, what do people usually come up with excuses? What are the usual excuses that people use to sexually assault women? Um, and we sat together and kind of brainstormed on all of the possible reasons and all the possible uh, excuses that women can come up with, that people come up with to accuse women of being the reason of sexual harassment, not the victims or the survivors of it. And we started putting the responses, kind of the logical answers to that, utilizing our common culture. The volunteers would follow up with the shop owners or with the doormen or with whoever and make sure that they are taking action. And the action that we would ask of them is to support the girl if she gets attacked, to make sure that harassers are um, are kind of pursued. So if they harass a girl in front of the shop, they try to catch them, they try to report it or help the girl report it. And we would give them the information on how to call the police and how to pursue this. I mean, the response varied. I wouldn't say that everyone supported this. And it's not an easy task. I mean, we're talking about also a small group that was going into small neighborhoods and huge cities across Egypt. It was not only in Cairo. We tried to have groups all over the country, but it was um, an attempt to to kind of raise this, um, to, to start to have this discussion in the street. Harassment has been a common experience for most women in Egypt. A 2013 government study revealed that over 99% of Egyptian women and girls surveyed reported experiencing some form of sexual harassment in their lifetime. Raji explains. Your regular Egyptian citizen is uh, conservative. I think it's it's how people view women. I think the fact that there is the thought, you know, the very conservative thought of that women should uh, stay home or if they go out in the street, be covered up and uh, not to attract attention. And a woman should only look attractive, uh, and, you know, to her husband or amongst her family members and not to appear in public, etc. Of course, I'm against that completely. And that's not everyone thinks that way, but that is one strain of thought. And the fact that they know they could get away with it. But I think the fact that there are some brave women throughout the past couple of years who have decided to not let them get away with it, even if it's verbal sexual harassment, harassment, not even physical, and they've taken action and they've gone um, you know, to police stations to file reports and so on, and they've decided to pursue it. And I think that's what's making it um, becoming a movement now. But it's taking time and it's not going to be easy. Um, because there is resistance, you know, within the culture. Not everyone, you know, people say, oh, but you're ruining the fu- his future. He's a young guy. He didn't mean it. He's going to apologize. All these kind of arguments that are said when, you know, women who go to police stations or to try to file a report. This is, there's always this like approach of, okay, let's just uh, let him, let the guy come and apologize and we won't have a police report filed. In the face of these attitudes, modern technology has become instrumental. Social media has become a powerful tool, one that the younger generation of women and girls are very familiar with. I think there's two things. The the generation uh, that is now, you know, very tech savvy and uses social media for everything in their life. This is the generation of people who are still at, you know, university in late 19, 20, 20, early 20s. Um, This is completely different from the generation I belong to. And the fact that, you know, Social media in Egypt is big. Um, the younger generation, you know, if you if you check the statistics, you'll see that 
people in Egypt use social media, Facebook, Instagram, and so on, very high uh, levels, as well as we have a very young, uh, growing population. A lot of high-profile sexual harassment cases in Egypt involve social media. A group named Assault Police has garnered over 200,000 followers on Instagram since its first post on July the 1st, 2020. That post was about an ex-student at the American University of Cairo, Ahmed Bassam Zaki. Zaki, it claimed, was a sexual predator who had gotten away with preying on a shocking number of women and underage girls. Although many girls and women had used social media to anonymously talk about boys or men who had sexually harassed them, the naming of Abdul Bassam Zaki was very unusual. But assault police were not the first to do this. That was a 22-year-old woman by the name of Nadine Abdul Hamid. I've always been a very outspoken person. I've, I'm, I'm not the type of person to typically say, okay, if this is how it is, then that's how it should be. I, I like to question things. Um, and I've, like, ever since I, for as long as I can remember, I've always been harassed constantly since I was a kid, you know, uh, harassed, followed, whatever. There have always been um, that kind of, you know, in my eyes, especially as I, I don't look Egyptian, even though I am, it's difficult for me. It, it is a threat, you know, for women to be followed, to be harassed. It is a threat. Um, and I've never been okay with it. Whenever someone does that, I call them out on it because it's not something that anyone should have to get used to. It wasn't really on my part to try and get justice. That wasn't my intention. My intention was to warn other girls because for me, like I didn't feel like there was anything I could do to him. I didn't expect to take this up legally <laughs> initially, but there wasn't anything that I felt like I could do that would have made him stop. But what I could do is warn girls and tell them, hey, this guy's a predator, so be wary. At the end of June 2020, Nadine, a student at the American University of Cairo, made a decision to talk about her experiences with Abdul Basim Zaki. She made a public social media post that she thought would go out to her 500 or so followers at the time. She clicked the share button on her phone, but was not ready for what happened next. I think I put it down for maybe five minutes and then my phone started blowing up for the next week or so to come it started going off and people were like, oh my God, that happened to me too. That that happened to me as well. You know, people started sharing and sharing and sharing. And by the next day it had like, I, I don't remember, I think it was like 300 shares on Facebook and God knows how many shares on Instagram, even though the, it was my personal account, it, it was my private account, but it was still shared. So it just, it started blowing up and people that it just, like so many people came and told me that he harassed them in one way or another or friends of theirs. And I got multiple messages, at least like, I think perhaps like, I'd say like 20 messages that night. I think I posted it at like 10 or 11. I posted it at night. So yeah, between for two hours, like 20, 20 messages about people saying the same thing. Um, and then obviously much more the next morning. Nadine didn't receive any hate mail or aggression for speaking out about her experiences, but she was still fearful. I was terrified. I, I was very scared. And like my whole family like, knew about this. You know, my, my mom was terrified that something was going to happen to me. We were, we were very scared about that. So the only thing that there was only one line that was going through my head uh, and it, it was... When the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree by the river of truth and tell the world, no, you move. For me, that's standing up, even if it's just by myself. Even if, I didn't think that this was going to blow out into a whole movement. All that I wanted to do was to, to help the girls, to, to pr protect them. That was the only thing that was going through my head is that I... If I'm comfortable with putting this out there, then it it is my duty, you know? I... I should be doing that because other, there was another girl that came up to me afterwards saying that um, they've been talking and, and uh, he, want, he has a birthday party coming up and, and he invited her. God knows what would have happened to her if she actually went. So yeah, for me, if it was just one person, if it was just that one person that, that was protected, um, then honestly, for me, 
it would have been all worth it. There was some negativity from Zaki's family, who took a common approach to many, one that was mentioned earlier in the podcast by Rajia. It was basically them asking me to remove the post and that we should be dealing with this um, between the two families and not make this public because we are tarnishing his future. We are ruining his future and his name and the family name and whatnot. And then uh, when I refused, they they were essentially saying that they were going to file a, a lawsuit against me for defamation. Such a case did not come to pass. Nadine did take the post down, but she didn't make the issue private. It was too late for that. The post had already gone viral, and as mentioned earlier, the group Assault Police had started posting about Abdul Bassam Zaki on their Instagram page just a few days later on July the 1st. After Rajia and her legal team contacted Nadine, they took the case to the courts. On the 29th of December 2020, in a rare victory for women in sexual harassment cases, Ahmed Bassam Zaki was sentenced to three years in prison for sexually harassing two women on social media. Zaki has a month to appeal the case, but it isn't the only one against him. Rajia Umran explains. I was facing currently two cases. Uh, one case, he's already received a three-year sentence by the first instance court, the economic court, which tries cases related to cyber crimes. Uh, and he is now uh, facing, there's an appeal of this three-year judgment before the economic court. And then another uh, criminal case in which he's facing various charges of uh, not just sexual harassment, but also uh, almost, you know, I'd want to call it because the term in Arabic is, is very dif- difficult to translate, but physical assault of various victims. Uh, two of them were minors. So he technically has two cases that he's uh, kind of facing. One is based on the claims of two women. The other one before the criminal court has the claims of five uh, women that brought charges against him. The sentencing of Zaki offers hope for the future and has galvanised many women and girls to share their experiences online. In July 2020, rumours began circulating online of something dubbed the Fairmont crime. In this horrific story, a woman was drugged by a group of wealthy young men and taken to a hotel room at the Fairmont Nile City Hotel, where she was gang-raped. Raju was approached to take on this case. It went viral, there was so much public support and stuff. The, the victim of the Fairmont rape decided to come forward after being quiet for six years. So she, she approached me and my colleagues. We, we decided to form this group of lawyers working pro bono on these kind of cases and we heard her testimony and because it had happened for you know a while ago we told her you need to have the video of the you know because these guys they they there was a gang rape and they videotaped the rape or the the incident and they it was people saw the video so we told her we need to get part of the video and you need to get witnesses because this was six years ago obviously you know she she never went to like forensic medicine she never like filed a report or anything unfortunately she went public or she gave the, you know, all the different Instagram accounts that were active at the time, you know, assault police and all these different accounts um, that sprung up overnight to support the victims of the sexual harassment and assault. Kept, you know, posting about the incident and, and I think they even wrote the names of some of these guys. So those guys were able to flee the country. The complications and challenges are vast for every case and one case isn't going to change a whole society. Rajia, who's been working on raising awareness on these issues for over two decades and continues to work tirelessly on pro bono cases to represent women in these kinds of situations, still sees hope. The ABZ case is extremely important. I think it's a turning point in the whole issue of sexual harassment, sexual violence uh, against women in Egypt. I think it's a great example when young voices and people from across the board in society, you know, activists, lawyers, um, National Council for Women, everyone kind of gathered around this case and supported and the public prosecution took action very quickly after the stories went viral. I mean, I think if you you do the timeline, I think the first post was on the 28th or 29th of June uh, 2020. And I think uh, Ahmed Bassam Zaki was arrested around the 4th or 5th of July. So the public prosecution took very strong action very quickly to arrest him. Um, and I think this encouraged the other women to file legal claims, you know, after after more people started writing about it, to act, to not just to not stop at just writing about it on Facebook or Instagram, 
and to also take it to the next level and file a legal claim and go to prosecution and be heard as a witness and, and pursue it to, until it goes to court. What does Nadine hope will happen as a result of Zaki's sentencing? I, I'm hoping that it doesn't take, it doesn't instill so much fear in girls anymore. I'm hoping that one day, because I'm still hearing stories about girls that are too scared to come forward. So I'm, I'm seeing that more and more people are coming forward and it makes me grateful. It makes me very proud of all the, the survivors. I don't like to use the word victim. Um, all the survivors that are coming forward and saying uh, what they have to say about people that have hurt them, you know, not accepting this kind of behavior. I would love to see Egyptian men more educated. For the most part, it is the sense of culture. And I feel like more and more we're coming to understand that what is acceptable and what is not. So I I, I hope that this is going to go faster than I think it will. And Engie's hope lies firmly with the younger generation. It's very refreshing to see also the younger generation being more outspoken. And I feel with time, we will see more and more young people being outspoken, using this, the, the available resources to them to make change happen. We only saw recently all of these cases going to the prosecution because of assault police and the work they've done advocating for their cases online. You've been listening to Beyond the Headlines. I've been your host, Aisha Khan. Thanks this week to Nadine Abdelhamid, Rajya Omran and NG Goslan. If you've enjoyed this episode, please click the subscribe button in your favorite podcasting app. And if you have time, please leave us a review. This week's Beyond the Headlines was produced by Arthur Edison and Hamza Hendawi.